The Witch of Blackbird Pond Chapter 18 In dry clothes with some hot corn mush and molasses inside her, Kit leaned against the back of the settle and soaked in the warmth of the fire. Lightheaded with weariness and relief, she looked around the familiar room. How beautiful and safe it looked with the sunshine slanting in the window. The regular breathing from Mercy's curtain bed sounded almost normal. Dr. Bulkley had said that Judith might get up this morning. Rachel had consented to go up to her own bed for a short sleep. On their promise to waken her at once if Mercy should rouse, and Matthew was preparing to get back to his work. Watching him draw on his heavy boots, Kit knew that she could not let him go without speaking. All night, just beyond the fringe of her thoughts, through the terror of the hunt and the long cold hours of waiting, she had cherished one small warming memory. There on the beach, it had been the one thing that had held her back when Nat had offered her a chance to escape. She had to make sure that this memory was rightfully hers. She got up shakily and went to stand before her uncle. Uncle Matthew, she said softly, I heard what you said last night to those people, and I want to thank you for it. Tis no matter, he answered gruffly. But it is a matter, she insisted. I've been nothing but trouble to you from the beginning, and I don't deserve your standing up for me. Her uncle studied her from under his bushy eyebrows. "'Tis true I did not welcome you into my house,' he said at last. "'But this last week, you have proved me wrong. "'You haven't spared yourself, Catherine. "'Our own daughter couldn't have done more.' Suddenly, Kit wished with all her heart that she had never deceived this man. She would like to stand here before him with a clear conscience. She was ashamed of the many times, more times than she could count, when she had skipped off and left her work undone. I shall tell him some day, she vowed to herself, when I'm sure that Hannah is safe. And I will do my full share beginning this very moment. I don't even feel tired anymore. She helped Judith into her clothes and drew a chair for her near the sunny window. She drew a great kettle of water from the well and set it to boil for the wash. She swept up the scuffed sand and spread a fresh layer in a fine pattern. She stirred up a corn cake for the midday meal. Hannah was safe and Mercy was going to get well. That should be enough and surely if she worked hard enough, she could forget this strange feeling of emptiness the haunting regret that a secret and lovely thing was gone forever. Matthew came back presently for the noon meal. Kit thrust the iron peel into the oven and drew out the corn cake, plump and golden and crisp around the edges, and Judith said the smell of it made her feel hungry for the first time. Mercy stirred and asked in a quite natural voice for a sip of water and Rachel's haggard face lighted with a smile. They were not alarmed this time by a knock on the door. Matthew went to answer it, and the others sat calmly at the table. They heard the scuff of boots in the hallway and a man's voice. We have business with you, Matthew. There's illness here, he answered. This can't wait. Better summon your wife, too, and that girl from Barbados. We'll be as brief as we can. The men stood aside to let Rachel and Kit walk ahead into the company room. There were four callers. One a deacon from the church, the constable of the town, and Goodman Cruff and his wife. They were not excited this morning. They looked hard and purposeful, and good wife Cruff's eyes glittered toward Kit with contempt and something else she could not interpret. I know you don't hold with witchcraft, the constable began, but we've some it to say as may change your mind. 
You arrested your witch? asked Matthew with impatience. Not that. The town's rid of that one for good. Matthew stared at him in alarm. What have you done? Not what you fear. We didn't lay hands on the old woman. She slipped through our trap somehow. And we know how, hissed good wife Cruff. Kit felt a wave of fear that left her sick and dizzy. The deacon glanced at good wife Cruff uneasily. I don't quite go along with them, he said. But I got to admit, the thing looks mighty queer. We've combed the whole town this morning, ever since dawn. There's not a trace of her. Don't see how she could have got far. We know right enough. They'll never find her, broke in good wife Cruff. No use trying to shush me, Adam Cruff. You tell them what we saw. Her husband cleared his throat. I didn't rightly see it myself, he apologized. But there's some saw that big yeller cat of hers come a-running out of the house. A couple of fellers took a shot at it. But the ones has got a good look claims he had a great fat mouse in his mouth. And it never let go, even when the bullets came after it. His wife drew a hissing breath. That mouse was Hannah Tupper. "'Tis not the first time she's changed herself into a creature. "'They say when the moon is full—' "'Now hold on a minute, Matthew,' cautioned the constable at Matthew's scornful gesture. "'You can't gainsay it. "'There's things happen we better not look at too close. "'The woman's gone, and I say good riddance.' "'She's gone straight back to Satan,' pronounced good wife Cruff. "'But she's left another to do her work.' Kit could have laughed out loud, but a look at good wife Cruff sobered her. The woman's eyes were fastened on her face with a cunning triumph. They found Summit when they searched her place. Better take a look at this, Matthew. The constable drew something shining from his pocket. It was the little silver horn book. What is it? asked Matthew. Looks like a sort of horn book. Whoever saw a horn book like that, demanded Goodman Cruff. Tis the devil's own writing. Has the Lord's prayer on it, the constable reminded him. Look at the letters on the handle, Matthew. Matthew took the thing in his hands reluctantly and turned it over. Ask her where it came from, jibed good wife Cruff, unable to keep silent. There was a harsh gasp from Rachel. Matthew lifted his eyes from the horn book to his niece's white face. Can this be yours, Catherine? he asked. Kit's lips were stiff. Yes, sir, she answered faintly. Did you know you lost it? Was it stolen from you? No, sir, I knew it was there. I, I took it there myself. Why? Kit looked from one grim, waiting face to another. Did they know about Prudence? If not, she must be very careful. It, it was a sort of present, she said lamely. A present to the widow? Not exactly. You mean she had some sort of hold over you? Some blackmail? Oh, no. Hannah was a friend of mine. I'm sorry, Uncle Matthew. I meant to tell you, truly I did, as soon as I could. I used to go see her on the way home from the meadow. Sometimes I took things to her. My own things, I mean. Poor Rachel, how that apple tart must be torturing her conscience. I don't understand this, Catherine. I forbade you. You understood it perfectly, to go to that woman's house. I know. Hannah needed me, and I needed her. She wasn't a witch, Uncle Matthew, if you could only have known her. Matthew looked back at the constable. I am chagrined, he said with dignity, that I have not controlled my own household. But the girl is young and ignorant. I hold myself to blame for my laxness. Take no blame to yourself, Matthew. The constable rose to his feet. 
I'm sorry, what with your daughter sick and all, but we've got to lock this girl up. Oh, no, burst out Rachel. You can't let them, Matthew. Since when, asked Matthew, his eyes flashing, do you lock up a girl for disobedience? This is for me to settle. Not disobedience. This girl is charged with witchcraft. That is ridiculous, thundered Matthew. Watch your words, man. The girl has admitted to being a friend to the witch, and there is a complaint against her, made according to law and signed. Who dared to sign such a charge? I signed it, shouted Goodman Cruff. The girl put a spell on half the children in this town, and I'll see her brought on to court if it's the last thing I ever do. Matthew looked defeated. Where do you aim to take her? he asked. Shed back of my place will do. There's no proper jail short of Hartford, and I've lost near a day's work already. Wait a minute. How long do you intend to keep her? Till the trial. When Sam Talcott gets back tomorrow, he'll likely examine her with the minister present. That's what they did to Goody Harrison and the Johnson woman. Been 20 years since we had a witch case hereabouts. Reckon there'll be a jury trial in Hartford. Suppose I give you my word that until Captain Talcott returns, I'll keep her locked in her room upstairs. What good is his word? demanded Goodwife Cruff. Has he known where she was these past months? She wants to see me in jail, Kit thought. She felt numb by the hatred in the woman's eyes. I'll trust you all right, the constable considered. But they some I don't trust. They was out of their minds down there last night. One more death in this town, and I won't be responsible for what happens. The girl will be safe with me, that I warrant. Rachel started forward, but Matthew motioned her back. Get her coat, he ordered. They stood waiting silently in the hallway while Rachel climbed the stairs, weeping, and came back with her own woolen cloak. And I think we'll stop here and continue with this chapter in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. I love you guys. Bye-bye.